before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of the fire by night from before the people. Amen. Do me a favor and just look at your neighbor and with a smile on your face and it'll make sense later and touch him on the shoulders and just say, it's all in the cloud. It's, it's all in the cloud. Find another neighbor. Come on, find one that didn't smile at you. It's all in the cloud. Amen. Alex Mbotu was 12 years old. And it was almost three years ago today that Alex Mbotu was traveling with his mother and father. They were migrating in a necessary migration. While they were migrating in a necessary migration, they passed and had to pass through the Kruger Park of East South Africa. That may not be familiar to you, but the Kruger Park of East South Africa is approximately 7,000 square miles. They were migrating, they were passing through the Kruger Park in East South Africa. And while they were traveling, Alex Mbotu, who was 12 years old, somehow became distant from his parents. His parents began to search frantically, but again, the Kruger Park is 12 or 7,000 square miles. On the first night, Alex found an anthill and laying on the anthill through the night, it kept him warm. On the next day, he realized he needed some water if he was going to make it. He searched and searched, but found no water. I should tell you, in the Kruger Park in East South Africa, there are lions, there are tigers, there are all, sites, all types of predators. And here was a young boy who was stranded, who was lost in the wilderness, and he had no guide. Things got bad the third day and the fourth day, and finally, everything just got cloudy. When I think about Alex and that hard story, it makes us realize that just like Alex was in need of some guidance, you and I need guidance in our life. I don't care where you're from, and I don't care how anointed you are. I don't care how many tongues you might speak in. God says that you need guidance. The good news is our text is tailored to teach us that God always gives guidance. I dare you to say that to your neighbor. God always gives guidance. Unlike Alex's circumstance and situation, God says, I will always guide you. In fact, that's the first point that our text is tailored to teach us, that God has perpetual guidance for his people. God is always guiding his people. The story of Exodus is really the story of God dealing with his people, and that's me and you. It's really the story of God dealing with his church. It's really the story of God taking a people who were enslaved, who were in bondage, and God did miracle after miracle after miracle grow over and over again offering plagues to set his people free God said you got to let my people go and, and in fact God made sure that Pharaoh let his people go but when his people were set free they were now in the wilderness and God said I will guide my people I love this story because it starts off with these two clouds really one cloud the, this cloud it was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And the Bible, it says several times that it was always before them. Amen. That it was always in front of them. That never was there a day when they would wake up and the cloud was not there. That never was there a night that they would look up and the fire was not there. That point is this, and it's a powerful point. God will always guide his people. God will never put you out and put you away without some direction and discernment for your life. 
Okay, uh, y'all, y'all not feeling me. Let me see if I can make it plain. Uh, 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 I remember we were teaching, this is about two years ago, we were teaching a Bible study on God's guidance. And I remember asking everyone in Bible study, uh, would you be willing, I, call, I asked people to come forward, would you be willing to let me blindfold you and then you have to race through the sanctuary going through the pews? And everybody said, Pastor, we appreciate you. <laughs> But we're not willing to do this game, and except for my son. He raised his hand and said, Dad, I'll do it. He was the only one silly enough to risk running through the sanctuary and hurting and harming himself. Well, how sick and sadistic would it be for the infinite to put the finite in an infinite world and then tell us that I'm not going to show you or lead you, but in fact, God does not do that. But God says, whatever your struggle, whatever your trouble, whatever the relationship, whatever the trauma, whatever the drama, I will guide you. In fact, it's Proverbs it's Psalms 31 verse uh, 3 that says, uh, you are my rock and my fortress and I will guide you for my name's sake. God does not just guide us for us, but he guides us because we are his and we have his name. God says, I don't care what it is you've got to face. I don't care what it is you've got to go through. I will be your guide. Oh, it's good to know that. It's good to know that. Even in the dark, he would guide them. And he was always there, not behind them, not, not just next to them, but in front of them. God said in a supernatural, okay, let me give you the practical uh, application of God's guidance in your life today. In, in fact, it starts off with the Holy Spirit. Would you say Holy Spirit? You need to accept and understand that Jesus Christ did not leave you comfortless or guideless. In fact, he deposited a GPS in your soul, and his name is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible said that he will lead you and guide you into all truth. I, I, I had to do that. Let me do it again. You, you didn't get that. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. That's why when you were getting ready to date that brother and all of a sudden you just couldn't feel him no more because God was leading you and guiding you into all truth. And it could be as simple as you were getting ready to go down the street and something said and you don't go that way. God was leading you and guiding you into all truth. God is not a distant father. God has not abandoned us, but God is their present help in time of trouble. Yes, he is with you and guiding you first through the Holy Spirit, but not just through the Spirit, his Holy Spirit, but through the scriptures. Would you say that the scriptures? All right, now we got to fight about this because a lot of people talk about the Bible, but few people, you know, uh, Donald Trump says his favorite book is the Bible. Yeah, uh, I'm not saying nothing about it. I'm just testifying. That's what he says. Uh, but, but can I tell you, I've even heard Christians say just because you know the scriptures doesn't mean you know God. And I have to rebut because you cannot fully know God until you know his scriptures. It's like saying, I go to the doctor, right? And the doctor says, Rev, if you're going to be healthy, you've got to get in shape. And I say, well, doctor, just because I'm healthy doesn't mean I'm going to live long. That is absolutely, cover your kids' ears, stupid. Because you cannot live God's life without the scriptures. You need them in your life. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a guide unto my path. God's word is there for you so you will have, check this out, not just a guide, but some guidelines. You, you missed that. God says part of living the Christian life is having the guidelines from God. I've given you the manual. I've given you instruction. I, I've given you direction. You need God's word. And I know you're erudite. I know you're educated. And you look real good. But can I tell you, you can never get to the place when you know all that God's word has to say to you. There's always something more in God's word because his word is alive and it's cutting like a two-edged sword. Woo! Praise God. First, it is the spirit. Then, let me say it correctly. First, he is the spirit. Then it is the scriptures, but then it is the shepherd. One of the interesting things about the book of Exodus is we're introduced to this concept in a human being, namely Moses. God gave the people Moses, and Moses was not God, and Moses was not perfect, but God did use Moses to lead and guide them. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. Now, we're going to talk about that another day, so we'll save it for the other day. Don't worry. Uh, but Moses was the shepherd. The shepherd guided the sheep. But not only that, then there was the shared voice of the body. That's why we're here today. Because we believe that, yes, we can worship watching TV, and yes, we can worship in our car, and yes, we can have our quiet time and our personal time, but God says that I'm going to do something in the body that I will not necessarily do at home. God is always guiding his people. The first thing this text is tailored to teach us is the fact that God has perpetual guidance. Perpetual guidance. Don't you think, just because it's dark, that God does not have a fiery cloud for you? Don't you think? Just because it's hot, that God is not hovering over you. God says, I will guide you. Oh, that, that's shoutable. That, that, that's shoutable. Don't, 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 don't leave home without it. Don't, don't leave here without it. You need to know that God is always. He's always God. Not only is it this perpetual guidance, but, but, but then there is the passing through the wilderness. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look at the text. In the text, please understand that even though God was guiding, they had to go through the wilderness. Even though God was guiding, they had to go through the wilderness. And the reason I had you back that thing up and read verse 17, because verse 17 under, helps us understand why they went through the wilderness. God was so good and God was so wise, they did not go the shortest way. And they, they, they didn't go the shortest way, verse 17. But instead, this is what the Bible says. It says it two times. But, but instead, he took them the back alleyway, and they got stopped at the Red Sea. This is the wilderness. Now, in our life from time to time, we will discover that we are in front of a Red Sea. And we start saying, God, I thought you said you would guide me. And God is saying, I did. And then you say, well, God, why did you guide me to the Red Sea? You just wait a minute. You see, the problem with the wilderness, God help me, God help me. The problem with the wilderness is you're no longer in bondage, but you haven't gotten to your breakthrough. You missed it. The problem with the wilderness is you've made it closer, but you haven't made it in. They had been in bondage, and now they were going to Canaan, the promised land. Oh, this is uncomfortable. This is uncomfortable. That is the problem with the wilderness. The problem with the wilderness is it is inconvenient and uncomfortable. All right, thank you, Holy Spirit. I, I talked to the Lord about it, and, and he told me he'd help me. I said, how can I make this plain to the people of God today? How can I help them see what it is to be in the wilderness? Don't make the assumption that because you're in the wilderness, you are wandering. They were not wandering in the wilderness. They were being led through the wilderness. God said, look, if I take you the other way, you will have to fight the Philistines, and you cannot handle the Philistines. So instead, I'm going to take you another way, and I will open up a Red Sea. And I will use the Red Sea not just to be your transportation, but I will use the Red Sea to be your vindication, because I will bring Pharaoh behind you, and I will shut that thing up. All I'm trying to do. That they had been promised uh, a promised land, Canaan. They had been promised a place that was great. And, and instead, they were in a desert, a wilderness. Now, please let me tell you, there are extremes in the wilderness. It gets very cold at night. And it gets very hot during the day. I, I said it like that for real. It gets very cold at night. It gets very hot during the day. I mean, it, it, it gets dangerously hot. But the Bible says that God led them. Check this out. Check this out. I, I, I noticed, I, I mentioned before, the light of the pillar. But don't just think about the light of the pillar because it gets very cold at night. And because God knew how cold it gets at night, he said, I'm going to send the, uh, the pillar of uh, the fire because it's going to give you my warmth to keep you warm. But not only that, because it gets very hot, what I'm going to do, and if you study the, the cloud, which we're going to do, you'll understand that it didn't, didn't just stay put, but it would move not just in front of them, but it wouldn't move over them because God understood that the sun got so hot that the sun would burn them. And they were uh, people who uh, were Hebrews. They didn't need a whole lot of suntan. And so what God would do is he would put a cloud above them. So they had cloudy days. You missed that on hot days. Okay. Okay. Lord, help me. I, 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 I said, Lord, help me explain the problem of the wilderness. Help me explain the problem of the wilderness. Lord, because we, we can't rush through this text until we understand the problem of the wilderness. And the Lord put it like this. 
The wilderness is something like the third trimester. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, let me make it plain for the brother. The third trimester is the point when you have been pregnant a long time. And after being pregnant a long time, you are ready for to deliver the baby. But wait, wait, wait. But God and the doctor says the baby is not ready. You say the baby has two hands, two feet, two legs, heads, arms. The baby is ready to. It's on my last, literally, nerve. In fact, your body, check this out, say so, miss this. Your body has been stretched, so your, your bones have literally pulled apart. Your body is now uncomfortable. Even your nostrils are broader. Everything about you has changed, and you are uncomfortable. So the doctor says, look, you, you technically can deliver the baby, but if you deliver the baby, then you'll be in the, the baby will be in the NICU. So what you got to do is you got to wait. You got to wait and trust. That in your inconvenience and in the uncomfortable time that God is working even though you cannot see his work. That God is moving even though you cannot feel him moving. And if you wait, then you'll be happy because after a little while, I'll break through and you'll have a breakthrough and there'll be a healthy baby boy. I'm confessing now with the wilderness is we don't like to wait mom I'm 18 now all my girlfriends and sisters they all doing what they want to do mom I'm 18 now I'm gonna move out and get my own place we don't like to wait I, I know the preacher in the church talks about abstinence but we's in love and I don't see nothing wrong. There can't be anything like that. We got to. I know I can't afford it just yet, but I qualify for it. We don't like to wait. But the problem with not waiting is we will find ourselves wondering. Okay, let, let me see. Uh, they were in the wilderness for how many years? Who knows? 40 years. Here's the problem. Uh, uh, it, it should have taken them 11 days to make it a 40 day journey. Now you do the math, but I don't understand how you can get that twisted and turned around. The problem is when we choose not to wait, then we have to wonder. I, 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 I didn't say that right. We have to wander. We have to go the wrong way so God can work on us and whip us back into shape. But God says, you don't have to do that. Do it my way. Go my way. The Bible says that our hearts are deceitful above all things. That simply means, I may not be able to lie good to you, but I can surely lie to myself. This text is tailored to teach us first that God has perpetual, perpetual, Guidance. God is always guiding. Texas Taylor to teach us that there will be the passing, the passing, get that, the passing, they weren't supposed to stay there. 40 years was not by design or desire. It was by default due to sin. Because when we decide to sin, we will enter in a space and a place called default due to sin. But then, after this perpetual guidance, after this passing through the wilderness, you need to understand that God's guidance is always a personal choice. That God's guidance is always a personal choice. That look, God who moves the sun, God who turns the earth, God who created you and established you, God who keeps your heart, he will not force you to follow him. God will not force you to do what he's called you to do. You can decide to tell God, get out of my face. You can decide to tell God, I don't want what you have for me. You can say, God, I'm doing it my way. 
And the challenge with telling God you're doing it his way is God will gently allow you to suffer your way. God will allow you to repeat what you've repeated before and before and before and before. God will allow you to go through that same maze of trouble and trauma. God help. God does not want you to do it your way. God wants you to do it his way. But God is so gentle and gracious, he will not force you to go his way. God's way, there's always where God guides, he provides. There's always provision. God says, if you go my way, I will provide for you. If you go my way, when God guided them, do you know they always had food? Scholars cannot define what manna means. It's just a heavenly substance. They had food that made them healthy was manna. They always had food. And even, Lord have mercy, this is another day for another time, so I won't get, even when they complained, what God did is God said, I'm so gracious, I'm going to fly some chicken over your heads <laughs> and give you some desert fried chicken. <laughs> but look, but they still did not follow God. I used to wonder why God used the plagues. These 10 plagues that each represented a foreign God. Why did God do that when he could have just snatched them out? God did not use the plagues for the Egyptians and for Pharaoh. God used the plagues for his people. He was trying to show them, I do miracles. That my way is miraculous. Not by sight, not by touch. Not by intellectual and professional and, and all that we think we bring to the table, but it's my way. In God's, oh God, help me. If, if, if you fail to see God's provision, provision in his guidance, then you will not follow his guidance. Not only is there God, God's provision in his guidance, but then there is God's protection in his guidance. Never think of God's guidance simply as direction. He always couples his direction with his protection. That's why they didn't face the, the Philistines. He always marries his protection to his direction. And God, help me, help me. God cannot fully protect you unless you fully submit to God's direction. God says that if you choose to go your way, then I cannot fully protect you the way that I desire to protect you. We have to decide whether it's our way or God's way. Amen. That is a test of faith. Because let me be honest with you, God's way never looks easy. God's way never makes clear, easy sense. Why should I get married before we live together? That don't make no sense. I need to see how they live in. Why should I give God 10% of the money he gave me? Double negative. That don't make no sense. Why should I submit to a husband who is just a man or just a human being like me? He ain't all that. <laughs> that don't make no sense. Why should I honor a person who I believe is dishonorable? That don't make no sense. The Bible has in four different places, the Old Testament and the New Testament, a phrase that reads like this. It's in Habakkuk, it's in Hebrews, it's in Ephesians, and it's in Galatians. It says, and the just shall live by faith. And the just shall live by faith. God will not allow you to see your way through life. He requires that you trust him. He requires that you get behind the cloud. He says, if you're going to make it to where I want to take you, you've got to get behind the cloud. You've got to follow me. You can do it your way or you can do it God's way. But you cannot have it both ways. And if you do it your way, in the end, you will wish that you did it God's way. 
you will repent and say, God, why did you let me? Why did you let me get with this brother who had no good intention for me? God, why did you let me try this needle and now I can't put it down? God, why did you let me drink this drink and now I can't get straight? God, why did you let me go wrong? And God will say, I asked you and I told you and I showed you, but you want not listen. Now, now here's the good news. But although, okay, I started off, I'm taking my seat, you've been wonderful. I started off by telling you about Alex, Alex, Alex M. Botu, who got lost from his parents at 12 years old in a, a 7,000 square mile park that was filled with danger. Day after day, he stayed in that park, wishing he could find his parents, but he could not find them. And at the point that he should have been dead, at day eight, with little to no food, with little to no water, somehow, he passed out and he heard his name. Alex, Alex, his father and his mother couldn't get a group of rangers in a search party, but they had one or two police and they went through that 7,000 square mile park looking for their baby boy. This 12 year old who did not follow, who got disconnected, his parents kept looking for that baby boy. And I've come by to testify that even when I've chosen not to follow God's guidance, God's goodness would not let me go. And God kept searching after me and chasing after me and looking for, you are mine, you will be mine. In fact, if, uh, if I have to beg and plead for your sympathy, I don't mind because you mean that much to me. God says, I won't let you go. Now yes, he got hurt and yes, he got sick and, and yes, he could have died, but God said just in the nick of time, I will keep you, I will rescue you, I will be your God, I will be your God only I ask that you follow after me, that, that you decide that my way is the way 